Okay, all set. Um, okay, uh, I'm just going to introduce our speaker in a moment, or our teacher for today. And you have seen, I believe, from the, uh, the website or from the Moodle page, the topic that we'll be covering. So uh, the issue that comes up here is when you start dealing with the credibility of scripture itself, how would you address someone who just throws out a charge, you know, a general broadside? Well, the biblical documents can't be trusted. There are all kinds of translations and textual issues and interpretational questions that aren't resolved. And so someone who throws that out as a general defeater for accepting scripture as authoritative, how would you address them biblically? Or what is, what is a proper process to walk through? as you're having that conversation. Um, if you're familiar with Bart Ehrman, he is a, a very representative figure for this, a very accomplished scholar. But um, you know, I've, I've listened to different uh, lectures from him and read some of his work. He just throws out general discreditors. He's, he's a text critic, this is what he does. But his whole argument is, well, you know, critically speaking, you can't really take seriously the text, it's a mess. Um, and I'll speak personally. I had someone very intelligent, very intelligent man, um, a man in business, very accomplished. He was a major figure in my hometown um, in a fairly large city. And uh, he ended up coming, he inquired at BJU because he had listened to a Bart Ehrman course. It was through the Great Courses series, which I generally really like. I like listening to them. Um, but Bart Ehrman does a course in there on the New Testament. And this guy was religious, uh, he was Anglican, or he was Episcopal. Um, but he had listened to this course and it brought a lot of doubts for him. And so he was coming to me, coming to someone at BJ for help because he wanted to learn Greek. And the reason he wanted to learn Greek was because he wanted to explore this question for himself because Bart Ehrman had put him off. And so I met with this guy uh, weekly and I tutored him to learn Greek for, we did this for like two years. Um, I would try to take opportunities to witness and stuff like that, converse with him. He's a very nice guy, very intelligent guy. Uh, but this is the kind of specific result that comes about from people casting around this kind of doubt. Um, and so that's one of the things we wanna discuss here to try to, try to discuss what that means and how that works. Um, the teacher for us today, Dr. Steven Anderson, holds an MDiv and THM degrees from Capital Bible Seminary, and then a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary. And then he has done just a lot of teaching and a lot of work around uh, in a lot of different places. If you're familiar with Bible Works, um, unfortunately closed recently, but he did some significant work there. And then Bibles International, Bible Places is where he's working now, is, in, is where he's employed. Um, and then I just got to know him personally at one of the churches that we visited uh, where we shared our ministry. So I, I'm elated that we'll be able to hear from him today. And um, with that, I'll stop there. If I could get Peter, if you're able to jump in here and just open us in prayer. Um, in fact, I'll take care of it here for you. I'll open up your mic and uh, just lead us in prayer and we'll go from there. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for uh, this uh, class time. We thank you, Lord, for our teachers. We, we do pray, Lord, that we will be understanding and assimilate the things that we're about to learn into our lives and ministries. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that we will uh, honor him uh, with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Anderson, we're ready. Okay, can you hear me all right? Sounds great. Okay, very good. I'll be covering a number of issues related to bibli bibliology today. And uh, thanks, Joel, for inviting me to uh, participate and teach today. Uh, and this is my first step at online teaching, so uh, hopefully there aren't any hiccups. Uh, I want to start with a discussion of higher criticism. Uh, just say a few things about it because higher criticism underlies a lot of the um, apologetic problems that are raised with the Bible. And I want to discuss the issue of canonicity, which brings up related issues and textual criticism. And the last two topics I want to cover are problem passages in the Bible and uh, issues relating 
to biblical ethics and morality, especially the Canaanite genocide in the book of Joshua. <clears throat> now, by way of, of introduction to the topic, uh, I believe the Bible is self-authenticating and needs no external proof of its validity. Now, for a detailed argument in support of that thesis, uh, I'll try holding up this book. Um, it's called uh, Peculiar Glory, how the, script, how the Christian scriptures reveal their complete truthfulness. Uh, it's written by John Piper. And what uh, Piper argues in the book is that even a child can understand and be certain, be 100% certain that the message of the Christian gospel is true because the Bible is self-authenticating and does not need any external proof of its validity. So uh, what he argues, uh, beginning from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 4 through 6, is that if the Bible is the word of God, then the glory of God uh, cannot but shine through its pages, similar to the way the glory of God is uh, revealed in the created universe. So uh, we come to know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ by perceiving the glory of God in our hearts as we hear the word of God and the Holy Spirit is at work in that process. Uh, so the whole Bible authenticates itself by the shining of the glory of God in and through it. Um, and that's uh, proof of the authenticity of the Bible for all who genuinely perceive uh, the glory of God. So um, that's, that's where I'm coming from uh, in this topic. I have a couple of uh, blog posts that I wrote that um, are relevant to this. And uh, Jill, is there a way to share my screen here? Um, I think there is down at the bottom. There's okay. in the middle, there's a share button. All right. So uh, okay, here we go. So uh, this is from my blog, which is uh, truthonlybible.com, and uh, one of the points I make here in uh, blog posts and what it means to have a biblical view of history is that the epistemic basis of history is faith and biblical revelation, not empiricism or rationalism. So when secular scholars uh, investigate archaeological or historical problems, they start with the presupposition that the Bible cannot be trusted, but Scholarly study of extra biblical archaeological data and inscriptions and literature can be trusted. And they say we start with the extra biblical material and interpret it on its own terms. And then we interpret the Bible in light of that extra biblical data. Uh, but this claim that the extra biblical data can be interpreted on its own, apart from the Bible and apart from any theological presuppositions, uh, that's just false. If you take the Bible away, you have to replace it with a different presuppositional framework, and that's usually atheism or deism. And then that presupposition de determines the conclusion of the research. Uh, the Bible is going to be viewed as a human product that is largely inaccurate because it, it claims divine activity in the world. Um, but how can that presupposition be justified? Why should we presuppose the extra biblical material to be more reliable than the Bible? Why should we accept secular presuppositions at all? And so as Christian scholars, we should uh, start with faith in the Bible as the word of God and uh, begin our historical analysis of the Bible and then work out to the extra biblical data uh, from there. So, uh, when we look at archaeological evidence or scientific evidence, we can find things that agree with the Bible, and, and I don't believe you can disprove any of the claims the Bible makes, but 
uh, we have to be careful not to replace faith with rationalism. Uh, the Bible doesn't become any more certain when we discover archaeological evidence that corroborates something in the Bible. Um, we believe the Bible by faith, but um, there is also evidence out there that um, that uh, corroborates it. So um, <clears throat> that again, that's my starting point. And um, there's more on that post that might be of interest, but uh, I uh, am going to move on to uh, other material. So <clears throat> higher criticism. Many of the apologetics issues in bibli bibliology excuse me, could be placed under the category of higher criticism. Now, the presupposition of higher criticism usually is not stated up front and directly and clearly by the critics, but that presupposition or the starting point of higher criticism is uh, the presupposition that the Bible is a purely human product. It is not revelation from God. And where does that presupposition comes from? Come from it comes from uh, the theological views of the critics that uh, there's no overt divine activity in the world, either because God doesn't exist or because he's impersonal or he's removed from the world. And then those presuppositions bring all sorts of implications to one study of the Bible. So uh, one presupposition of higher criticism is uh, coming from the presupposition that the Bible is a human product is that the Bible is not a unified book by a single divine author, i.e. the Holy Spirit. Instead, it's a disharmonious uh, collection of compositions by many different writers who held many different viewpoints on theological and historical issues with many of those viewpoints uh, being in contradiction to each other. Uh, another uh, uh, implication of, of higher criticism is that there can be no genuine predictive prophecy. So all the passages in the Bible that are traditionally viewed as predictive prophecy actually have to do with events in the author's own time. So uh, that implies that books such as Isaiah and Daniel and Zechariah are not a unity, but some parts are written very late. Uh, so Ze uh, Isaiah talks about Cyrus. Well, if you don't believe it's possible to predict the future because only God can do that, then um, you have to assume that those passages that talk about Cyrus were written during or after the lifetime of Cyrus, not um, uh, 100 or 150 years earlier. And likewise with Daniel, which is probably the biggest problem for critics in all the Bible is Daniel 11 and also Zechariah. Another implication of the critical view is that there can be no miracles. Uh, so all the stories of miracles in the Bible are considered to be either fairy tales or something you can explain by natural phenomena. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, the critics assume that the Bible contains many errors because other human writings contain errors, so therefore the Bible should contain errors. If it's a human product, it should reflect the biases of the people who wrote it. Although it's interesting that the writings of the critics, if you read their books, uh, they don't have any errors in their books. Um, they're 100% certain of what they're saying, 100% correct. Um, <clears throat> 
another implication of the critical view, the religion of ancient Israel and the religion of early Christianity were natural developments of human thought based on the cultural milieu of the ancient Near East. Uh, so the Bible is not revelation, it's just evolution of religion. And then the biblical authors relied on many outside sources to develop their material. Again, uh, Bible isn't revelation, it's, it's something that was man-made. And then finally, any conclusion that violates the presuppositions of higher criticism are disallowed from the start. So uh, the presuppositions are absolute and uh, they determine all the conclusions. However, the critics don't say that up front. They, they present arguments in a facetious way as if they're looking for the truth objectively and honestly, uh, when really they're just trying to uh, support their presuppositions. Now, with those uh, presuppositions of higher criticism, uh, they're going to result in a methodology for Bible study that will be far different from the methodology used by believing Bible scholars. So making the assumption that there is no predictive prophecy implies that many books of the Bible are forgeries. They're, they were produced after the fact by pseudonymous authors. And so then that leads to a big search for the real authors and for the hypothetical process by which the book came to be created. And so you get into source criticism and redaction criticism <clears throat> and uh, searching for a, a hypothetical life setting for the passage and an interpretation of the book that fits with the presuppositions of the critics and their theories about the, the background of the book. And so the commentaries get very creative here. Um, uh, there's a search for the sources that the human authors use to create their account. Um, and then the presuppositions also become the goals of the study. So books of the Bible are analyzed with the goal of disproving their genuineness. Even though the critics don't say that directly, they, they make it appear as if they're just trying to understand what the Bible means, what it says. Really, they have a, a spiritual aim uh, of disproving the genuineness of the Bible. So that's some background to higher criticism. At one time, evangelical scholars had a united voice in opposing higher criticism. These were the good old days when um, evangelical scholars had the view that it's us versus them. Uh, it's uh, the critics versus believers. Now things are a lot more fuzzy in evangelical scholarship. Um, higher criticism really has crept into evangelical circles, into evangelical commentaries and seminaries. And so when we talk about doing apologetics, it, um, we're not just responding to critics. Unfortunately, we're also often responding to evangelical scholars who have adopted critical positions that uh, weaken the uh, evangelical view of scripture. So what has happened is higher criticism has been evangelicalized. The terms and the methods used by liberal scholars have been slightly modified and redefined by evangelical scholars who then use them. So we have many evangelical scholars talking about doing redaction criticism and source criticism and trying to do it in a way that it maybe is not exactly the same as the way the critical scholars do it. Um, but making concessions to higher criticism begins a causal chain and the logical conclusion of that causal chain 
is always an outright rejection of the Bible as revelation from God. So this is something that I want to encourage you to be very careful about. Um, there are many Bible scholars today who are asking the wrong questions, evangelical Bible scholars. Um, are asking about the impact of background, materi background material and uh, hypothetical sources on the text. Uh, the literary structure of the text, you think uh, what's wrong with analyzing the literary structure of the text? Well, it becomes a problem when you say this verse means a certain thing because of, of the genre or the literary category or the literary form that it belongs to instead of of uh, looking at what the text literally says and interpreting it literally. This is just a, a way of, of getting a figurative interpretation into the text often. And I will um, show you another uh, blog post that I wrote that um, you can uh, look at on your own time if you're interested. Um, it's called Asking the Wrong Questions. And I address a couple of the questions that uh, you will commonly find evangelical scholars asking when they approach a biblical text. What did this text mean to the original recipient? And what was the intended meaning of the human author? Uh, those sound like reasonable questions to ask, but when you start digging into the implications and the way uh, people use those questions, particularly to attack the traditional literal interpretation of prophecy, um, even uh, messianic prophecies about Christ, then we run into big problems. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that. <clears throat> Okay, um, now canon, and by the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, I see one. Um, I wonder anything that the biblical presuppos uh, presuppositionalists can learn from the diligent argument. Um, all right, let me move on to canon. Um, the critical view of the canon of scripture uh, for actually both the Old Testament and the New Testament is that it is a, a canon is a concept created by religious leaders who wrongly declared human writings to have a divine origin. And the process by which the concept and limits of canon were defined is supposed to have taken centuries after the books of the Bible were first written. So um, the Jews at some point, maybe at, at the uh, so-called Council of Jamnia and the Christians at some point decided that a group of writings that were in circulation uh, were actually from God and they started to venerate them, which they shouldn't have according to the critics. and. Uh, this is something that, that happened a long time after the, the, the uh, books of the Bible were written. Well, when we look at the Bible itself, we can see this isn't the, the actual process by which uh, the canon was formed. So for an Old Testament example, Daniel chapter 9, beginning of Daniel 9, Daniel says he is reading the book of Jeremiah's prophecies. And that was very soon after Jeremiah had written his book, uh, within, within a couple of decades after Jeremiah had written his book. Presumably Jeremiah uh, traveled from Egypt to Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar invaded Egypt. And so um, this, this book of Jeremiah is hot off the press and Daniel treats it as the word of God, as the inspired scripture. Uh, so there, there is no process by which the book of Jeremiah uh, had to be vetted or had to gain respect in the community in order to be added to the canon. 
<clears throat> and throughout the Old Testament, there are references to the law as the word of God. In the New Testament, we find Jesus recognizing the Old Testament canon as including the books from Genesis to Chronicles or the Tanakh in uh, Matthew 23, 35 and Luke eleven fifty one, 51, where Jesus references all the uh, murders in the Old Testament from the murder of Abel to the murder of Zechariah. So Jesus recognizes a traditional Jewish canon and not any of the apocryphal or pseudepigraphal books. And then um, finally, 2 Peter 3, verses uh, 15 and 16. And uh, you can look at those verses if you would like. Uh, those say, uh, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. And um, so Peter refers to Paul's epistles. And uh, okay, thank you. So um, I see in the screen there, verse 16, um, Peter says, as they do also the other scriptures. So he refers to Paul's epistles or Paul's letters, and then as also the other scriptures. And so that implies that Paul's letters are scripture. And um, at this time, actually, Paul probably had not even written 2 Timothy. 2 Peter was probably written before 2 Timothy. So um, before Paul had even finished writing all of his epistles, Peter said, um, these are scriptures. but Peter is not informing his audience that Paul's epistles are scriptures. He's assuming that this is something they understand. He isn't making an argument for it. Um, so the church, uh, I believe, did not reject any of the apostles' writings. They were all considered canonical, and they were all considered scripture from the day they were written. Um, and... Uh, I'll throw this in also, the verse says all of Paul's letters, so I don't believe there are any lost letters of Paul. I, I believe they were all considered scripture, and there are issues in First and Second Corinthians, but uh, I don't believe there's a lost letter to the Corinthians. Um, but this idea that some books of the New Testament only became known very gradually in the church over a process of centuries, and were gradually recognized as canonical that uh, just isn't supported from 2 Peter 3. Uh, Christians in the Roman Empire were constantly traveling throughout the Roman Empire and they were bringing their books of scripture with them. So uh, Paul's letters were widely circulated right from the start. And uh, also this idea that there were um, text types that uh, circulated within local communities uh, before they became known to the church at large. Uh, I don't believe that that is taught in the Bible or even supported historically because the Roman Empire was crisscrossed by a network of roads and sea routes and travelers were always going from one part to another. Uh, Christians and churches were in regular contact with other Christians and churches. so it wouldn't have been possible for an apostolic writing to remain undiscovered for even a few years, let alone decades. Uh, Christians were very eager to uh, have writings of the apostles. And so the books the apostles wrote uh, circulated very rapidly. It's also interesting that Peter refers to Paul's epistles as a group. He says, uh, all of Paul's epistles. So that implies that there is already a collection recognized of the Pauline epistles. And it's noteworthy that every manuscript of the New Testament that has been found is written on a codex. Even the early manuscripts that were written on codices 
whereas pagan literature from that era is written on scrolls. And the reason for that seems to be that scrolls are hard, large scrolls are unwieldy. They're hard to use, hard to carry around. And Christians uh, wanted to read the books of the New Testament as collections, not as independent works. And that meant that the codex was the most practical form to use for carrying them around. Um, <clears throat> but again, Peter speaks as if all of his readers recognize that Paul's epistles are scripture. There, you know, there is no dispute about that. There are no arguments. Uh, Paul repeatedly claimed to write by inspiration. Uh, he says, I received of the Lord that which I'm telling you. Um, he commanded his letters to be read in the churches. You have that in Colossians 4.16 and 1 Thessalonians 5.27. Paul uh, commands his letters to be read alongside, by implication, Moses and the prophets. And there are even three places in the New Testament <clears throat> where one New Testament writer quotes an earlier New Testament writer as scripture. And these are very interesting. Again, given the critical view that uh, the whole idea of canon developed very late, this does not fit with the critical view. Romans 4.19 is quoted in Hebrews 11.12 without an attribution. Uh, Luke 10 verse 7 is quoted in 1 Timothy 5 verse 18. And that one is interesting because it is quoted in parallel with Deuteronomy 25.4, and it's prefaced by the words, for the scripture says. And then finally, 2 Peter 3.3 3 is quoted in Jude 18, <clears throat> and that quotation is prefaced by an attribution to the words of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we all know that there are, were church councils that discussed uh, the issue of canonicity and uh, there were guidelines drawn up to define uh, which books were canonical and there were arguments among the church fathers about which books were canonical, which ones weren't. But, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> but uh, those councils came well after the first century. So uh, what happened was there were heretical movements in the early church, especially the uh, Gnostic sects. And uh, there were pseudonymous works published that uh, some of these groups claimed were canonical. And that created confusion in the church and a need for uh, defining the canon, uh, listing out the books of the New Testament canon and arguing why these books that the church had always accepted as, canon as uh, canonical were canonical. So what, what are the criteria of canonicity? Um, and those controversies and also the growth of the church away from its roots in Judaism necessitated a definition of the concept of canon. At uh, the time of the first century, the whole idea of canon had been taken for granted. Um, <clears throat> but later on, it has to be defined precisely, similar to the way the doctrine of the Trinity has to be defined precisely in later centuries in response to um, heretical viewpoints in the church. Uh, but the uh, Trinity and canon were not major controversies in the first century church. It was more uh, law versus grace, church versus Israel. <clears throat> um, there are also strong indications in, um, well, from uh, 1 Timothy 5.18, which we already mentioned, and then 2 Peter Three, which I already mentioned, that the New Testament scriptures were accepted as canonical immediately when they were written, and therefore the church believed right from the start that 
uh, the writings of the apostles were canonical. And those books would not have been copied so profusely and read in the scriptures and cited by the church fathers if their canonicity was doubted. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's, it's only later on when heretics tried to exclude certain books and add others that confusion developed and you had uh, even some of the church fathers confused about which books were genuine and which ones were not. Um, for apologetics, uh, you can make a note of the papyrus, the Oxyrhynchus papyrus 405. Uh, so P. Oxy 405, which is dated to the <clears throat> last half of the second century or the first half of the third century. Um, <clears throat> that papyrus, which may be a manuscript of Irenaeus, places a carrot in the margin before each line of a quotation of Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, um, which indicates that it is considered uh, scripture because Old Testament passages were also marked with carrots in the margin and they were quoted. <clears throat> and, uh, Finally, the whole concept of canon assumes that the biblical documents are inherently authoritative. They're not granted authority by the community or the church. If, the, if a document only becomes authoritative when the church declares it to be authoritative, then it's just a human product. Um, so the Bible's authority does not depend on any human recognition of its canonicity. It doesn't matter if the church declares a book to be canonical or not. Uh, the Bible is powerful and, and it is authoritative because it is the living, abiding Word of God. So, <clears throat> some implications of uh, a biblical view of canonicity. One is you can throw out the theories of redaction criticism and, and the critical theories of the formation of the biblical text. Uh, the books of the Bible were written at, at one time in one piece by single authors with, with a couple of uh, exceptions, but uh, essentially that is the case. And they were considered inspired scripture from the day they were published. Um, now this has major implications for textual criticism. Uh, the uh, critical view of canon, again, is that uh, books of the Bible were not considered scripture until well after they were written or well after they began to be written. And therefore, mainstream scholars today uh, aim, to, aim to recover the initial text rather than the original text when they practice textual criticism. So in other words, they want to find the earliest form of the text that was considered canonical by a believing community, whatever that means, rather than talking about the original inspired words of God as I would, uh, and uh, we would as evangelicals. So the issue of canon is linked to the issue of textual criticism. I would argue that the aim of textual criticism is to find the original inspired text of the autographs. And so I'm, I'm trying to find the original text. That's going to produce a very different result than if you seek to reconstruct the text as it stood when supposedly it was made the official Bible of rabbinic Judaism or Orthodox Christianity. Um, so contemporary critical scholarship has merged redaction criticism with textual criticism. And the critics have actually taken the position that there was never an original text or an autograph of any of the Old Testament books. There was just an initial text that was chosen by Jewish religious authorities as the officially sanctioned canon sometime in the Second Temple period or maybe even after the Second Temple period. Um, and I believe that's a very extreme and 
anti-historical position. It, it isn't supported by any of the textual, manus, uh, textual evidence we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls um, or any of the ancient references to the text of the Old Testament. Um, but the, the critical view is that the books of the Bible are uh, more or less all inauthentic forgeries. There might be a few New Testament books that were actually written by Paul or other apostles, but uh, for the most part, they're inauthentic forgeries that were uh, composed and edited gradually over a process of centuries. And they were not recognized as divinely inspired scripture, even as a coherent, defined collection of works until religious authorities created the concept of canon and chose one version of the texts that were out there to be the official one. <clears throat> and that official version is called the initial text. Um, textual variants are often considered not to be the result of copying errors or scribal edits made to the original text, but instead uh, they're viewed as the work of different independent authors or independent editorial schools who created completely different uh, editions of the book before one version of the book was selected as the canonical form. So textual variants in the new critical view are not necessarily the result of textual transmission. They're rather part of the result of the literary formation uh, history of the text. <clears throat> so when scholars talk about textual variants today, which is different from the way it used to be, um, they also talk about their theories of the history of the formation of the biblical text. Uh, they have replaced the concept of text types, which developed from a single original manuscript, with the concept of separate literary editions, which lack a genealogical connection. So in the New Testament, um, that results in an increasing openness to readings of the majority text um, as the official form of the text accepted by the church. And Bart Ehrman uses this uh, argument, uh, or he uses this view to argue that the church change the Bible. So he says um, the pericope of the adulteress in John 8 is not in the earliest manuscripts. When you do textual analysis, you can tell that it's something that was added over the process of time. But the church declared it to be the official, part of their official Bible at uh, some point in the Byzantine era, perhaps. And therefore, uh, it was different from the original Bible. Therefore, Christians changed the Bible to suit their theology, he argues. Um, however, uh, that's based on his view that uh, the Bible is not what was originally written. It was what was accepted later on. Uh, you could use his argument to to show uh, that uh, Christians changed the King James Version because that's accepted as a Bible by many Christians today. But if you have the uh, correct view that it's the original inspired text that uh, is, is the unchangeable Bible, then um, uh, Bart Ehrman's arguments aren't, aren't uh, any problem. <clears throat> so, newer newer editions of uh, of the New Testament texts are becoming more eclectic and incorporating more readings of the majority text, but with a caveat that that it's proof that Christians changed the Bible supposedly for theological reasons. In the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> the critical view uh, results in seeing the Septuagint and uh, many Qumran uh, 
text traditions as equal to the Masoretic text or superior to it as historical witnesses to the earliest forms of the biblical text. So the critics, again, in the Old Testament, no longer make any attempt to find the original text of the Bible when they do text criticism. They just assume there is no original form and what we have in the Septuagint, what we have in the Masoretic text are uh, different uh, editions of the uh, of uh, what we know as the Bible, uh, different original editions. And unfortunately, some evangelical text critics have adopted this view. And <clears throat> for example, there are uh, many evangelical scholars who will say that the Septuagint edition of the book of Jeremiah was uh, kind of like the first draft of the book, and then the Masoretic text is the final draft. And uh, I wrote a paper arguing against that, um, and uh, I don't believe that view has any merit from a text critical uh, viewpoint, but it's something that, it's an assertion that critical scholars make that unfortunately, uh, many evangelical scholars have adopted. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I did some reading on the uh, work that the UBS or the United Bible Societies translators did uh, for the Hebrew Old Testament text project. And this was exactly the view that they held when they uh, were making text critical decisions. Uh, they were not trying to reconstruct the autographs. They, they didn't think the autographs even ever existed. They were just uh, trying to reconstruct the text as it appeared maybe in the second or third century BC in uh, believing communities. But uh, they, they felt that the whole Hebrew Bible had been significantly reworked and why they felt this is a book worth studying or worth translating, worth believing in, I don't know. But <clears throat> it's important to emphasize that the critical views are, they're all a uh, hypothesis. There isn't a shred of hard evidence for this view that um, uh, there were, were no autographs. Uh, it's something that's considered dogma by mainstream scholarship because these guys realize that the alternative view is going to lead to acceptance of, of the Bible as the word of God. Um, and unfortunately, again, some evangelicals have adopted the form of this view. You'll find some evangelical scholars claiming that the goal of text criticism is to find the initial canonical text that uh, began to be copied after the hypothetical redactional activity ceased. But that view uh, it seems to me to be at odds with evangelical theology. So for example, if Daniel did not actually write the book of Daniel, which is basically narrated in the first person by Daniel, then the book is a fraud. So inerrancy demands the existence of, the, of autographs and uh, therefore as text critics, we need to make an effort to find the original text of those autographs. Um, but also we should not be misled when we read, uh, when we read what the critics say about uh, the original text of the Bible, you have to realize that they're not talking about the autographs, they're talking about something that comes centuries after the autographs. <clears throat> okay, Joel, do you have anything you would like to uh, jump in and say, are there any questions I've been missing I need to address? Great, uh, let me go through here. There were a couple that came, uh, came by as we went. Um, 
So someone was asking here, um, as far as the autographs go, Maseratic does not necessarily equal the original. Um, how would you interact with that question? Sure. So um, all the manuscripts that we have contain um, copying errors. Uh, that's why we need to do text criticism. Uh, the uh, the manuscripts are not ident identical to each other. Um, I would argue that both the Masoretic text and the Septuagint can be traced genealogically to the original autographs. So um, they, they're, they come from the same original document, but um, I would argue the Masoretic text pre preserves the most carefully copied manuscripts and the Septuagint and uh, certain Dead Sea Scrolls of Samaritan Pentateuch show evidence of sloppy copying practices and even pre-editing of the text. Um, and there's various evidence we could look at for that. Uh, the uh, scroll that was discovered at the time of Josiah was, uh, it's called the, the scroll of the law or the Torah written by the hand of Moses. And uh, presumably that was the original copy of the Pentateuch written by Moses and uh, put by the side of the Ark and the Holy of Holies. So you would have um, 800 years from Moses to Josiah where there are uh, going to be no copying errors in the text of the Pentateuch and then new copies made after that time. But that's one example of how uh, a manus uh, how um, manuscripts could survive for a long time and um, uh, not develop many errors in the copying process. Probably the pogrom of Antiochus IV in the mid second century BC destroyed all the surviving autographs of the Old Testament, if there were any surviving autographs at that time. Um, there are descriptions in, I believe it's first Maccabees and also Josephus of Antiochus searching for copies of scripture and burning them. And it's also alluded to in Daniel 8. And then it happened again and the temple is destroyed in AD 70. We lost the best manuscripts and the Romans burned the temple. Um, <clears throat> but we know that the Masoretic text preserves uh, a very early form of the text because um, the the pointing of the text preserves uh, grammatical forms and spellings that were no longer in use even by the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and many of the Dead Sea Scrolls add maters or uh, vowels to the text that the Masoretic text does not have. So uh, we know the Masoretic text was very conservatively copied and that the pointing preserved a very early reading tradition. And then um, also when we compare medieval Masoretic manuscripts with the manuscripts at Qumran, for the most part, they're almost 100% identical, maybe 99.5 or 99.9% .9 identical. So uh, the, the copying practices of the Masoretes were able to uh, almost completely uh, stop the process of scribal errors accumulating in the text. Uh, that's so helpful. Um, what do you think, uh, any, this is a follow-up question here, but so open to Jesus, synagogue, uh, Bible in Luke 4, or just anywhere, you know, you've seen this, I think Geisler did some work on this. Um, worked through a document, I've worked through a document once where he categorized a very helpful layout to see where the New Testament is quoting from the LXX versus quoting from the NT, um, the Masoretic versus the Septuagint. So anyway, what, how does that strike you? Do you take those when you see the New Testament quoting, preferring the Septuagint over the MT, do you take that as this, the New Testament pointing us that way in those cases, or how do you view that? Okay, sure. Um, 
so the, the New Testament quotes from the Septuagint often, but often it um, also quotes from uh, either a different uh, translation or it appears the New Testament writers are giving their own translation of the Hebrew text. Um, so <clears throat> this is actually an argument in the early church. Uh, Jerome and Augustine had a big argument over whether Jerome should be translating the Vulgate from the Masoretic text or from the Septuagint. Um, Augustine argued that the Septuagint was the Bible used by the New Testament writers, and uh, Jerome argued that uh, the Masoretic text was the text preserved by the Jews. Um, and Jerome ended up winning the argument. Um, so I, I think the New Testament writers quote from the Septuagint often just because that was the Bible most people had, that was the Bible they were familiar with. I don't think they're saying that the Septuagint is superior to the Masoretic text. Um, it'd be like if if your pastor quoted from the New Living Translation, uh, it may not be uh, the best translation all the way through the Bible. Even that verse may not be precisely translated, but uh, that doesn't mean it's not the Word of God when he quotes it. Um, and I, I think it's the same thing with the Septuagint, that it was just the Bible people had, and we shouldn't draw any implications about the Septuagint being superior to the Masoretic text uh, because it's quoted. And again, the, the Hebrew text is often quoted in the New Testament as well. It's helpful. Um, okay. Uh, what do you think of the, so the, you mentioned the first page, the adultera. Um, what do you think, or the question is how it was worded here, how would you do introduce that passage to your Bible study or your seminary class, or let's go apologetics. Somebody throws that in your face. Um, how do you view that passage? How would you talk about that passage? What do you do there? Okay, so uh, this is going to, your, your answer to that question is going to depend on uh, much larger questions about uh, how you view the uh, how you view textual criticism <clears throat> in general. Um, uh, what's your view of, of textual criticism? Are you majority text? Are you uh, critical text? And um, so those are probably larger issues than I can discuss here quickly. But uh, my view is that the pericope of the adulteress is not authentic. Uh, and that's because of, it's partly because of my uh, overall view of New Testament textual criticism. I'm, I'm not, uh, majority text priority. Um, <clears throat> but so so I think it's I think when all is said and done your overall approach to New Testament textual criticism will determine the view you come out to when you analyze the evidence on a pericope. Uh, people who favor the majority text will accept the pericope as genuine. People who who uh, favor the critical text will reject it usually if you're strongly committed to the principles behind that theory. Um, so, um, I actually, I think this was, um, this highlights one of the problems that uh, Bart Ehrman exploited. Many people were shaken by Bart Ehrman's arguments when he appealed to this passage in the longer ending of Mark as proof that Christians had changed the Bible because their pastors had taught them that these were part of the Bible and the uh, Bible publishers always put these in the Bible and um, usually don't put them in a footnote or in brackets. 
that I present in this part of the text. So, uh, because people had never heard that there is controversy over these passages and, and there's evidence that they're spurious, many people are really shaken by Ehrman's arguments. Um, now, again, I think if you look at the manuscript evidence, you have overwhelming evidence for omitting the pericope. Um, the F13 family of Minuscles actually puts it in Luke instead of after John, so after John uh, 1752. So it looks like uh, this story is floating around and scribes wanted to put it in somewhere. There are several other places where this is stuck in to manuscripts. Uh, many manuscripts that have it know that it is a doubtful authenticity. Um, <clears throat> the Byzantine text is, is divided throughout the pericope, which is uncharacteristic of the Byzantine tradition, but that indicates that it, there were multiple points of entry into the mainstream of the Byzantine tradition uh, that this text had. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so, yeah, I, I would I would argue from the uh, his, the uh, textual evidence and also certain internal characteristics of the pericope that uh, it is not genuine. And uh, if you make that argument, then I think that's a strong rebuttal to Ehrman's viewpoint. And uh, also with Mark 16, we have direct evidence there from uh, Jerome and also I believe Eusebius telling us that most of the manuscripts in the fourth century AD did not have the pericope. So we don't even have to discover manuscripts. We have church fathers telling us what the manuscript situation was like in their day. Um, and that most manuscripts uh, of the Gospel of Mark ended at verse eight. So if you take my view, then you just argue against Ehrman that <clears throat> the passages he's citing are not part of the original text of the Bible. If you take the majority text view, I, I guess then uh, that's that's your problem. You'll have to find a way to, a uh, different way to respond to Ehrman. <clears throat> I think it's really helpful. I really, I found helpful what you said here um, because maybe on some level we weren't terribly honest or terribly terribly open with people about some of this stuff. They were vulnerable. And then, you know, one day they come across the data and they're totally thrown. Um, a little bit maybe what happened to us about a decade and a half ago with, when the King James only issue really hit all at once. So because we didn't explore that with people, they were just vulnerable. Um, really messed some people up. But yeah. Okay, one more, and then we should take a break. Um, is there any is there any any comment you would have as far as the structure of the Psalms, the fivefold collections, the subdivisions, even the headings? Um, how do you view those as as part of the text? How do you view all of that? Sure. Okay. So um, when I mentioned that we have original autographs for all the books of the Bible, I also said um, there are a few exceptions and um, Psalms is one of those exceptions. So the uh, <clears throat> structure of the book of Psalms, the division into five books is a very ancient division. It's something that is in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is found in all the manuscripts. So uh, I believe that the book of Psalms was originally written in five parts. So book one was the, uh, <clears throat> the original uh, collection of Psalms. And then, uh, and those are all Psalms of David. Then book two, the next collection, mainly Psalms for the chief musician. Book three, Psalms 79 through, or 73 to 89 are Psalms by the temple singers. Then uh, book four and uh, book five uh, being the, the latest book. Um, 
Book five contains the only clear exilic psalm, which is Psalm 137, and also the only clear post-exilic psalm, which is Psalm 126. So <clears throat> book five must, uh, must represent the final inspired edition of these psalms to the previous uh, collections of the book of psalms. Um, and um, in terms of how that fits with redaction criticism and uh, theories of the composition of the Old Testament text, I don't think that's a problem for us uh, because there, um, there were just five inspired prophets, probably David the first one and Ezra the last one. And you can hypothesize who came in between. Maybe Isaiah was one who uh, added collections of Psalms that were written at various points in time under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit until finally you have the uh, canonical form of the book with uh, all five uh, books of the Psalms there. And you're just adding more Psalms to the collection without changing what was previously there or editing it. And as far as the headings of the Psalms, um, the the headings or the inscriptions are part of the Hebrew text of the Psalms or in every Hebrew manuscript. And so um, I, I believe they're authentic, they're original. You, you have appeals um, to the uh, inscriptions in the New Testament. So for example, in Matthew 22, Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees and he makes an argument on the basis that Psalm 110 was written by David. And both Jesus and the Pharisees accepted without any question that Psalm 110 was written by David, which is because the, you have an inscription that says a Psalm of David. Um, also the Qumran scroll 11 Q Psalm A uh, consistently has the uh, titles of the Psalms in line with the main text. They're not even separated from the main text of the Psalms. Um, and then also many of the uh, superscriptions of the Psalms point to a historical situation that is different than what a later rabbi would guess if you didn't have that uh, ascription there. Someone who came in a later period was guessing at the historical background for the psalm, they'd make a different guess in most cases than the one that is in the description. And then um, some of the psalms with the greatest number of historical allusions have no superscription, which if you're inventing titles, those would be the easiest ones to put a superscription in, in with a historical background. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, Many of the technical terms in the psalm titles aren't translated by the Septuagint, which indicates that they're using words that were unknown by the second century BC, and therefore these titles go back uh, far earlier than even the second temple period or the, uh, the mid second temple period. Um, so uh, the yeah, I argue. I would argue that uh, the headings of the Psalms are all authentic and part of Scripture. That's helpful. And even in terms of uh, the countering the redaction idea. Okay, so basically, what I got out of that is the Psalms, by definition, you expect that there is some um, putting things together. You know, right? You know, I mean, because you have different literary units, and so it's, it has to be assembled somehow which strikes me a little bit. I did something recently in Ecclesiastes is that where it ends, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many properties with a great care. That helps me understand why in Ecclesiastes, I find some things that are parallel to other works of literature because Ecclesiastes tells me he did that, right? Um, and so it doesn't affect my doctrine of inspiration. It tells me he went out into the world, he found some things, he fixed them <laughs> and then he included them. 
So, I mean, where scripture itself tells me, yeah, I did some redaction here, and then I gave an autograph, and there it is. Don't be shocked if you've got some things that were put together, somebody assembled something, told you so. In other cases where it says Moses wrote this, don't go assuming that for 100 years people were twisting it and me messing around with it, and then we finally got a form that the believing community accepted. Um, anyway, helpful. It's good. Anything you want to add to that concept, or you good? Um yeah, yeah, sure. It, the biblical authors, as you said, do sometimes note uh, historical sources that they use. And so um, uh, you, you have that in Kings and Chronicles where they're referring to, to historical source documents that they reference. Um, redaction criticism focuses on <clears throat> changes made to the text after it was written. and so that's where um, generally I'd have a problem. There, there is an issue in the Pentateuch with some updates of geographical names, which I don't think was a problem if, if Ezra does that um, under inspiration. But for the most part, it doesn't happen in the Bible. That's great. Very helpful. OK, um, we're a little over our time on break, so let's just take a five minute break. I've got 16 minutes after. I'll see everybody back at 21 after. So we'll do our normal five minutes. See you back in five minutes at 21 after the hour. Thanks. Okay, so the last two topics I want to cover are problem passages and then uh, objections to biblical ethics and morality, especially Canaanite genocide. <clears throat> so as you probably know, if you read critical commentaries, the critics um, allege that there are factual errors and moral errors and contradictions throughout the Bible. And for the most part, um, they're doing nothing more than making subjective assertions based on the hypothetical critical view of the formation of the text and the hypothetical theology of, of the author and so forth. And uh, those types of attacks on the Bible are, are not a heavy weight attacks. We can just dismiss them because they're all hypothetical. Although, unfortunately, um, we're seeing too many evangelical commentators today accepting these, uh, some of these critical theories or about the uh, formation of the text instead of uh, viewing them as attacks on uh, the uh, biblical text as, as they should. Now, there are a small number of places in the Bible where believing Bible scholars, evangelical Bible scholars, have uh, for centuries seen an apparent problem. All of those passages have been uh, studied at length. They've been written about. There have been various explanations offered. Uh, multiple explanations often, and uh, you can read about them in commentaries, uh, journal articles, etc. Um, <clears throat> the fact remains that there are a very large number of competent scholars, evangelicals, who believe that the Bible is 100% without error. Um, there has never been a book that has been so scrutinized by the critics like the Bible has. And the Bible has completely withstood the text. You wouldn't have so many thousands and thousands of evangelical Bible scholars who have, who have really studied the Bible and studied the background issues and still affirm that the Bible contains no errors if there is some genuine contradiction or false doctrine or historical mistake in the Bible. <clears throat> now, those, if there was a mistake, it would have been proved a long time ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so just on that basis, we can have confidence that there are no errors anywhere in the Bible, that this is something scholars have, have been studying for a long time, and uh, the Bible has withstood the text. Now, <clears throat> what do we do when we face an apparent problem in the biblical text? What's the best approach? Well, I believe the best approach is to start with the text. So figure out what is the text saying? Is it clear? And then trust it. 
Um, and an easy example is Genesis 1. Um, you have an apparent problem there where uh, many scholars, uh, obviously the, the mainstream view is that uh, God didn't create the world, that uh, the world evolved very gradually, that was not created, the universe was not created in six days. And uh, some early, even fundamentalist Bible scholars in, in the uh, early 20th century, the late 19th century, accepted evolution. And they came up with the day-age theory or the gap theory. And that was shown really to be foolish because the scientific evidence doesn't support evolution like uh, the critics said it did. And uh, there has been a lot of great work done in creationism in recent decades. Uh, <clears throat> this is also the approach I followed in my doctoral dissertation, which is on Darius the Mede. And uh, that dissertation has, uh, it challenged uh, what was what were the main evangelical viewpoints, but I've had many interactions with evangelical scholars and uh, basically all the feedback I've gotten has been positive and um, the view I've taken is is being taken in commentaries and journal articles that uh, are being published or have been published recently. Um, so I, I just began by studying the biblical text and um, found that the evangelical explanations of Darius the Mede that were current didn't fit with what the book of Daniel said about Darius the Mede. Therefore, they must be wrong. Um, Daniel presents Darius the Mede as a different individual than Cyrus and someone of higher rank than Cyrus. And so I started digging into uh, commentaries and found an older viewpoint and identified Darius the Mede with Cyaxarus II. And then when I dug into the extra biblical evidence, uh, inscriptions and Greek historians, uh, I found that actually the weight of extra biblical evidence strongly points to the existence of this Median king who was a co-regent with Cyrus at the time of the fall of Babylon. He was a real king, not just a governor or a, a subordinate. Uh, he was king of the Medo-Persian Empire. There's all kinds of evidence for that, even without the book of Daniel. But um, because mainstream scholarship had strongly asserted a different version of Medo-Persian history, evangelical scholars since the late 19th century had just assumed that that version of history is right and they looked elsewhere for a solution to Darius the Mede. And so uh, the lesson I, I would take from that is just trust the Bible. And when you trust the Bible, if, if you're sure what the Bible says uh, and trust it and start digging into the extra biblical evidence, you're going to find uh, that the biblical text is supported. <clears throat> Another uh, thing I would say by, by way of caution is um, we don't have to resolve every apparent contradiction in the Bible in order to believe the Bible is true and, and without error. Um, there is a place for faith in Christian theology. Um, so we're not rationalists per se. Our faith is not contrary to reason. And uh, actually, I have a couple of uh, blog posts on this that um, you might be interested. I'll uh, digress and share these briefly. Um, uh, the virtue of faith, uh, faith is a mean between gullibility and skepticism. So I, I describe what faith is. And then um, the rationality of faith, I have a, a 
an article describing the relationship between faith and reason. Um, so my example here about uh, not needing to resolve every contradiction in the Bible or apparent contradiction in the Bible in order to believe it is their chronology of the kings of Israel and Judah. So for centuries and centuries, Bible scholars knew that the numbers given in the biblical text for the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah seemed to contradict each other. And they could not find a solution. So that was a case where it looked like you had hard numbers in the biblical text and, and they contradicted each other. One said this king reigned this many years. One said this, uh, the king reigned a different number of years. And, and there are many of those contradictions uh, between kings and chronicles when, when uh, talking about the the uh, number of years kings reigned and, and um, the events that happened in specific years of their reign. But it was wise on the part of evangelical scholars not to dismiss the Bible or abandon biblical faith just because they couldn't figure it out. It was assumed that there was some solution out there that no one had figured out. And uh, actually in the 20th century, in mid 20th century, Edwin Thiele and others after him who uh, refined his work applied research into ancient systems of timekeeping to Kings and Chronicles and found that the numbers in the biblical text are actually perfectly accurate. They harmonize perfectly with each other and with uh, the extra biblical records of uh, Assyrian kings and, and other extra biblical texts. Um, everything fits. But that's something that we didn't know until we found out there were all these different systems of timekeeping in the ancient Near East and certain kingdoms use certain systems and other ones use different systems. Um, and then there were co-regencies between Hebrew kings, just as there were in other kingdoms of the ancient Near East um, and, and everything fits. Um, so the, again, that's a case where it looked like there was a contradiction. We couldn't find a solution to it, but it was eventually shown that there wasn't actually a contradiction, even where there appeared to be one. <clears throat> and we also have to remember that we don't have the original manuscripts or the autographs of the Bible. And just because there are errors in copies of the manuscripts that we have doesn't prove that there is an error in the original. And in many cases, manuscript discoveries or textual research have shown that what were thought to be problems in the biblical text are actually only problems in certain copies of the biblical text. And uh, again, we've already mentioned the different endings of the Gospel of Mark. That's one where uh, we have found early manuscripts that, that don't have that. Um, in addition to the testimony of the church fathers. So um, we, we have more clarity, I think, on the uh, textual situation of the New Testament than we had at one time. But in the Old Testament, there are places where uh, there appear to be wrong numbers in Kings or Chronicles. And even if those numbers in the manuscripts that we have are wrong, it doesn't prove that the wrong number is in the original. And then finally, <clears throat> some of the problems that people point to in their Bible uh, are only problems with the particular Bible translation that they're using. And that's where it's helpful to know the original languages and be able to go back to the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and show people what the original says and that what they think is a problem really isn't when you look at the original. Okay. Um, so the last topic I want to cover is uh, biblical ethics and morality. 
And uh, this is a problem in Western culture today as our culture becomes increasingly hostile to God and the Bible. More and more criticisms are being raised of the morality that is taught in the Bible. Um, one prominent example of that is the Bible's condemnation of homosexuality. Another one is the Bible's teaching that men have the rightful place of authority in the home and in the church. Those are things that many people in our culture today would say are, are morally wrong. The Bible is wrong, uh, morally. <clears throat> so the fundamental question I would have for people who criticize the moral principles given in the Bible is, what is the basis for the moral standard in your worldview? Uh, most people haven't thought very deeply about that question. They just take ideas about what's right and what's wrong from the culture around them. Uh, ironically, actually, popular culture becomes the judge of morality, even though we look at popular culture and we think, how miserable is that? Uh, but when you look at uh, philosophical attempts to find a, found, a foundation for morality apart from the Bible, apart from Christianity, all those attempts fail miserably. So some people go the utilitarian route and they say that uh, what's right is whatever does the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, there are several problems with that. One is that assumes a concept of what is good. Another is that authorizes the oppression of small minorities for the benefit of the great majority. And then that, that's just an arbitrary standard as well. Uh, you can't use that standard to justify itself. You could define what's right subjectively as what, this is just what I think is best. Um, but then it's disingenuous to condemn other people as if they have violated an objective standard. And secular culture keeps changing. What is considered right and wrong in our culture keeps changing. Uh, or if you take the scientific view that matter is all there is, uh, materialism, um, then human actions are determined by mechanistic interactions of subatomic particles or just machines. There is actually no morality or free choice. But of course, that contravenes everything we know by our human experience. We, we do make choices, we're not just machines, and there is such a thing as right and wrong, and the universe didn't create itself, it's impossible. There has to be a, an eternal creator. So <clears throat> the uh, foundation for our morality is that it's part of the nature of the creator. Uh, so, in other words, morality is objective. Uh, it's part of God's nature, and God has revealed what is right and wrong to man in the Bible and in our conscience. Problem is that in our sinful state, um, in our fallen state, we're sinful, and we hate God, and we rebel against what is good and right. Um, so, as Christians, we need to keep going back to the Bible for our values and not take our values from the world around us. And also, <clears throat> especially when we talk about something like God's command to wipe out the Canaanites, we don't need to justify that. We don't need to justify anything that God does or anything that God commands as if we need to excuse his actions. We need to, to find some way to excuse God. Um, really what we need to do is to try to understand God's nature in order to bring our perspective into alignment with his so that we have the right perspective. So we shouldn't ask, how can we justify God's <clears throat> command to wipe out the Canaanites? The question um, we should ask is, um, excuse me, <clears throat> what are the moral, <clears throat> What are the moral principles behind God's command to wipe out the Canaanites? <clears throat> so we're not looking for the justification, we're looking for the uh, moral principles. Um, <clears throat> so 
I'll, I'll spend some time uh, talking about the Canaanite genocide and then uh, uh, take questions. Um, this is a common theological objection in the book of Joshua that when God commands Israel to wipe out the entire indigenous population of Canaan, the men, the women, the children, the infants, that, uh, well, that violates modern human rights standards. But uh, the bottom line is that the wicked don't see any reason why they should be destroyed. And they complain when God punishes them for their wickedness. And the fact is that God would be fully justified in wiping out any or all of the wicked at any time if he should choose to do so. Um, <clears throat> so instead of asking, why did God order these wicked people to be killed? Better question would be, why does he normally not? And um, the answer is that God is merciful. So uh, this is also an answer to the question people have of why is there so much suffering in the world, so much evil in the world. Uh, it's actually because God is gracious and kind and merciful. If God was not so kind and merciful, he would wipe everyone out. He wouldn't tolerate any evil. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but there are people who feel that the wicked should go unpunished, that it's unjust. In the case of the Canaanites, it's unjust for God to order them to be killed. Um, but uh, we can point out that uh, God sent his own innocent son, who was totally innocent, to die the most cruel death imaginable in order to redeem wicked men. Um, so any suggestion that God is unmerciful to the wicked and doesn't want them to be saved completely overlooks the death of Jesus. And we can also note that God waited 600 years after promising the land of Canaan to Abraham before wiping out the Canaanites. And God says specifically in Genesis 15, 16, that he wants to give the Amorites more time to repent. So people who think it, it was merciless for God to order Israel to wipe out the Canaanites forget about those 600 years of grace. Uh, it'd be like, the Allied armies stopping at the borders of Germany in 1945 and deciding to delay their invasion until the year 2550 in order to give the Nazis a chance to repent. Well, we'd say that's ridiculous. We'd never do that. And that's because uh, we're, we're just not as merciful as God is. We can't understand God's mercy. Uh, he's, he's far more merciful than we are. And there were some Canaanites who were not wiped out. Rahab demonstrated faith, and Rahab and her family were spared, which shows that God's command to wipe out the Canaanites was premised on their spiritual condition. Um, also, um, the Gibeonites were spared. Evidently, they repented in a way. Uh, and it's interesting that in both cases, it was a group that repented. So this is a group culture, not an American individualistic culture. And you would see repentance or rebellion happening as a group, not as individuals. So you had a couple of small groups that repented, but the others um, were hardened as a group and did not repent. Uh, so there weren't individuals in these cities who who uh, repented. And uh, God says several times in the Pentateuch that the reason why he's ordering the Canaanites to be destroyed is because of their wickedness. You can reference Deuteronomy 9.5 and Deuteronomy 18.14. <clears throat> you can also uh, reference Isaiah 14.21, uh, which explains part of the rationale behind God's command to wipe out the Canaanites. If the children were allowed to survive, they would carry on the sins of their parents. Um, and we can ask, is it, was it unjust uh, for God to order the young children, the infants 
to be killed. Well, from an eternal perspective, they're probably better off for it because they're in heaven right now. If they had been allowed to live, most of them would, would be in hell right now. Uh, they would not, uh, they would remain pagan. And also, uh, God is the creator of all human right, of all human life. And as a creator, he has a moral right to take life away at his discretion. He doesn't have to explain his actions. He doesn't have to justify himself uh, in the court of human opinion. And we all do die when God appoints uh, the right time for us to die. Uh, so God, God has that right. Now, we need to emphasize that the command to wipe out the Canaanites is a direct order from God given to the people of Israel at a very specific time and place. This is not a universal authorization to wipe out all infidels everywhere. And we don't have a command like that anywhere else in the Old Testament or the New Testament. There's, there's no command, wipe out the infidels. Um, this is just something that applied to that very specific historical situation. And if critics say that uh, this justifies killing people a day, they're just uh, you know, being unfair to the biblical text because the Bible does not uh, draw that implication anywhere. <clears throat> and then uh, finally, there's also the, the issue related to Canaanite genocide, but also other passages in the Old Testament that um, some people have this idea that the God of the Old Testament was vengeful and the God of the New Testament is gracious and merciful. So somehow God changed and the way he was yesterday is not the way he is today. Well, that's based on a very superficial reading of the text because the New Testament actually has far more to say than the Old Testament about God's eternal destruction of the wicked and uh, eternal torment of the wicked in the lake of fire. Uh, there's much more in the New Testament about hell and lake of fire than there is in the Old Testament. And uh, much of the teaching about hell in the New Testament is actually given by Jesus in the Gospels. It's in all four Gospels. So uh, this, is, this is right at the core of Christianity uh, and right at the core of the of the gospel message. The whole reason why Jesus had to die was because uh, death is a penalty for sin. And if you don't accept Jesus' death for sin, then you're condemned to go to uh, the lake of fire for eternity. But Jesus offers um, salvation from that. So why are people appalled by an Old Testament passage that talks about uh, God physically ending the life of Canaanites, but they don't have the same reaction to Jesus in the gospel. When Jesus talks about people being tormented for all eternity, and I think they just have a carnal outlook. They believe uh, this world is, is where it's at, and, and this life maybe is all there is, and they don't really believe in hell. Um, so they just read the New Testament very selectively, accepting what it says about living in the here and now, but not accepting what it says about warnings of a future judgment. Um, and uh, even the message of Christ's second coming to establish his kingdom, that's a message of universal judgment. Um, so this is something that, that is very central to the teaching of the New Testament. Um, and uh, there's just there's a greater emphasis in the Old Testament on temporal punishment for sin, but in the New Testament there's a greater emphasis on eternal punishment for sin, and there really is no difference um, in God's moral viewpoint uh, from the, the Old Testament to the New Testament. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, and then. One more point. Um, I find it interesting that many of the critics who are bothered by 
the uh, command to wipe out the Canaanites don't actually believe it happened. Uh, they, they don't believe Israel ever invaded the land of Canaan and, and wiped out these cities. Um, so it's somewhat disingenuous for them to come to Christians and criticize God and criticize the Bible as if all of this happened when they don't believe it ever did happen. Uh, okay, so I'll stop there and leave time for responses or questions. Uh, your last point made me, made me laugh, but yeah, I mean, you're right. Great, great point. It's good. Um, great, great, great discussion there. Thank you. Uh, one or two things that just popped up in my mind as you were going through there. Yeah, so this point you made about the New Testament versus Old Testament, the do the Marcionite thing, you know, God in the Old Testament is vengeful. Um, I just was working through not that long ago, it was, it was this last semester, Revelation 14, uh, the passage where the, the great battle happens and the blood is up to the horse's bridles. I mean, it's a horrible passage in the sense of just the, the, the judgment. But don't we can't go back to Joshua and kind of wipe it out with some kind of way of you know, squeamishly going around. Judgment is awful because sin is awful. So, yeah. Um, and if these passages turn our stomachs, they're supposed to turn our stomachs. I think I really appreciated your emphasis there to say, hey, don't try to, um, don't try to ignore this or ameliorate this or mitigate this. The Bible says some of these things in some of these places, and this is this is the nature of sin and judgment. It's serious. Don't try to s squirrel around it. It's good. Um, but then I I love the connection into recognizing, okay, so we, in the process maybe of mitigating these things apologetically, if we're like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll be more accepted if I can try to make the Joshua passage go away, make the Revelation passage go away. Uh, you just mitigated as well the gospel. You just mitigated the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of what Jesus did um, or the beauty of what Jesus did. Great points. Thank you. Um, you made a passing comment. I just wanted to make this connection. This was from, we did last semester history, history, church history, and we did a good discussion there, a couple of lectures on historiography. One of the things that came up there was different standards of ethics in histor historiographical writing. So that, um, you know, a person writing in 2018 has certain very strong ideas of the way that morals and ethics are supposed to work. And so they'll come down really hard on somebody. Um, from 1500 years ago and and the guy 1500 years ago maybe wasn't living under the same regime of societally defined ethics and so it becomes a very uh, unfair judgment because you know in 2018 of course we're enlightened and we figured stuff out um, so that you know we now realize that homosexuality should be defended even though human history at large has not in general agreed with our viewpoint, but in 2018, we figured this out. So now we can just judge all of human history according to the standard that we just figured out the last couple, you know, four to five years. Um, and I, I think this is a great point you're making here. It's okay, so if as the apologist, I go around and I try to reconfigure my interpretations or reconfigure my explanations with the changing winds of what the culture is currently telling me, uh, really, anybody who looks at, you know, what somebody wrote a generation ago, we just look like fools because we're constantly shifting in order to make this work. How about at some points we say, okay, here you've misunderstood the Bible on this or that point. So no, the Bible is not telling us jihad. You've misunderstood the Bible. Let's correct them on that. Okay. And let's help them understand some of these other things that you talked about. But at some point in the discussion, I step forward and I just say, but you're not going to like this but God judges sin and it's serious. And at some point in the discussion though, I clarify some things, you know, okay, yes, help them understand jihad is not in the Bible. At some point though, it just comes out. It's just straight and you're not gonna like this. And this does not fit uh, the assumptions of 2018. That's okay, there's a lot of stuff that's wrong in 2018. Um, great. One other thing I was going to toss in here, I'm just blabbering on and on, sorry. Uh, one other thing to toss in here is I think it's fascinating with the, um, the ban, this discussion, the genocide. When you come further, Israel actually comes under the ban in a sense later. I mean, there's some parallels. There's some, I think it's Isaiah. Somebody does some things that tie in and it's basically what happened to those Canaanite nations, that's you now because they were wicked, God judged them, 
you're wicked, you've acted like the Canaanites, so what do you think happens next? Um, and there's, there's not really a thing going on in the Old Testament like, well, they're, they're not Jewish, so just kill them all. Um, it's not that. It's tied to sin. So if the Jews for hundreds of years, 600 years, if they're going to do this too, they're going to, it's going to come under the same judgment. I, I think that's very, very fascinating. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's any comments there? Point. Talk to me about, I mean, I'll just blather on in there. Anything you want to help me out with <laughs> or clarify or fix? I just said. Yeah, I, I thought you made a really good point there about um, uh, <clears throat> people not not uh, appreciating what the Bible teaches regarding judgment for sin, also about uh, the equity of uh, the judgment of Israel uh, when uh, Israel deserved judgment. Um, and uh, so it isn't just uh, a racial issue there. So, yeah, good point. Right. That's a good way to say it. Yeah, part of maybe our strong reaction is because we connect genocide so strongly to race. And so we think of it as an ethnic thing or something. Nice. Um, I'm pasting this in here. This is a lecture we did, I don't know, a year or two ago. Uh, Dr. Barry, Tim Barry, that's here, he did a lecture on uh, difficulties and how you work with difficulties. So anyway, that's a two hour lecture that was under hermeneutics, if that's helpful. Okay, I'm rolling back through here uh, questions, and if someone has a question, pop it in there quick, because uh, we want to use the time here well. Uh, someone wanted to know here, how do you, and this is a little off far off field, but it's fine. Uh, how do you feel Usher is dating the you know, 404, or how far do you stray from Usher, or just how do you view that? Okay. Um, so I, I do believe the Bible has an exact chronology from the fourth year of Solomon's reign back to creation. And there are specific chronological markers given in the book of Genesis that are in there just so you can make direct concrete links going all the way back to creation. A chronology is the backbone of history. If you, if you just have disparate events and you can't connect them with each other, you don't have a history. You have to have a chronology to make sense of them. Um, Usher uh, got the length of the Egyptian sojourn wrong. He had it as 215 years instead of 430, which um, I think Exodus 12, 40, and 41 is very clear that is 430 years, not 215 years. So uh, there, there are a couple of small corrections I'd make to Usher, but in general, I agree with the idea of having uh, an exact chronology. And if you look at the genealogies in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, Genesis 11 in particular is the important one for uh, archaeology. There are no room. Uh, uh, there is no room for gaps in there. Uh, you have an exact number of years between each link in the chain, even if you add another person, which I don't believe you you can. Um, is you would still have the same number of years. And uh, so I believe the flood happened in the year around 2518 or 2517 BC. And that's when our archeological record starts. So I'm throwing out all the earlier dates in archeology, span which uh, are often presented very dogmatically, but uh, when you dig into the reasons for those dates and the evidence for them, it's all very flimsy stuff. It isn't until we get to later periods when we have very strong evidence for the uh, dates that are given. Helpful, great. Um, okay, uh, one other question here. So this was in respect and just give us us. Um, oh, wait, never mind. I'm going to take us another direction. We're going to ask two questions. Any comments on numerical contradictions in the Old Testament? Um, I think you already really talked about that. And I would say maybe Dr. Barry's lecture gives us some more. Um, anything you want to add? If, if those things, there's a lot to look at if someone wants to filter through this. Anything you want to add, though, quickly to that numerical contradictions or you feel good about what you've already talked about? 
<clears throat> yeah, well, I think that those are basically problems within evangelicalism. I, I don't think there are any critics that would say, oh, I'd become a Christian if you could just show me how these couple of numbers fit in Kings and Chronicles. Uh, that isn't their main objection to Christianity. It, it's it's something that I care about as a Bible scholar, um, trying to figure out what the Bible uh, says precisely. Um, there is really a remarkable amount of agreement between Kings and Chronicles and other parallel uh, parts of the Bible, especially when you consider that they aren't copied word for word from each other. They're written independently uh, from different perspectives, like the Gospels telling the same story in different ways. Um, the writer of Chronicles must have been familiar with the Book of Kings. He must have had it, and he wanted to give a, a different perspective on Israel's history. So he would have been able to look at all the numbers that were written in Kings and, and uh, Samuel, and he wouldn't have knowingly contradicted them um, unless he had some clear reason to believe that those numbers had become corrupted in the copying process. And then later on, even just average scribes could easily see differences. So. Um, if there are different numbers in the original manuscripts, it, it has to be something intentional, not something that was overlooked because you'd have to be really, really dull not to see a, a numerical contradiction. Um, if there are different numbers, there, there's there's some something going on there where maybe uh, Chronicle is talking about the, the price of the whole field and Kings is just talking about the price of a threshing floor or something like that. Um, and we do know that there are many places where manuscripts have corrupted numbers. So it isn't far-fetched to assume that uh, you could have similar mistakes made in the transmission of Kings and Chronicles, um, which by the way, were very infrequently copied. There was only one manuscript of Chronicles found at Qumran. Um, and you also have issues with um, the relation of inerrancy to the use of sources. And um, if, if there is an error in the original source and the biblical writer copies it, is that okay? I would argue that um, if we believe the Bible is the word of God, then whenever source material is presented by the biblical author as factual information, it should be considered an error. Um, it's only when an author is explicitly quoting a non-inspired source uh, and is presenting that as a quotation that we could say, well, there could be errors with that. If uh, we're if the biblical author is reporting the, the speech of Rab Chaka to Hezekiah, of course, Rab Chaka could have errors in what he says. Um, and <clears throat> if, if the only apparent discrepancies in the Bible are ones that can be explained by simple copying mistakes, to me, that's evidence that the Bible is inspired because, and, and inerrant, because if, uh, if, if it was just a normal human writing, there would be some real substantial glaring contradictions that go way beyond anything you could explain by a copyist mistake. Great. Okay. Excellent. Very good. Um, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to finish this out here. We're over time. This was great. This is just a lot of content and uh, very thankful for your giving the time like this. This, this was excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Yeah, I, this, I really appreciate your time. Um, I'm pasting in two things here before we go quickly. I will put one of them up on the Moodle page, and so you can access it. That right there that I just pasted in is the notes from last lecture. So if you want to get those, that's from my lecture notes, you can pull those in. Someone asked about that. And then it'll be on the Moodle page as well. You can get it there. Um, and then the last thing is 
be prepared for next lecture. We're going to have really excited about it. It's a, um, a biologist doctorate in uh, entomology from BJU, uh, entomology insects. But he's going to talk to us about science and apologetics and just talk us through some of the issues that come up there. Um, so it'll be a high, high quality lecture. It's one I'm looking forward, been looking forward to for the entire class and um, really want you to be in for it. I hope you all are able to come in and give your questions and interact. Uh, so thank you again. I very much appreciate your time, Dr. Anderson, and um, we very much benefited from it. So thanks to all and uh, have a great day or have a great night wherever you are. Thank you.